Consider this. When was the last time you had a great night's sleep? Or a terrible night's sleep? Chances are good that if your bad nights have been more than your good ones, you've been telling everyone you know in hopes of getting some advice for catching those elusive Zs. But take heart, sleepless ones. Help is on the way. I'm Yvonne Greer. My guest is Dr. Sarah Zalek, director of the Illinois Neurological Institute Sleep Center. Next on Consider This. Around my house, one of the first things we say to each other when we greet after good morning is, how did you sleep? As a mom, I know that means if they didn't sleep well, I might have a grumpy Gus on my hands for the rest of the day. I'll bet you've had a similar situation at your house as well. But Dr. Sarah Zalek is here to help us remedy some of those situations from the Illinois Neurological Institute Sleep Center. That's a mouthful. Welcome to you. Thank you. It's very nice to be here. So when someone has a bad night's sleep, I know there are a myriad of reasons why that could happen. Let's start with some of the physical ones. What is it that could prompt someone not to have a good night's sleep? Oh, so many things. I think of things that prompt us not to have a good night's sleep as sort of either internal things, medical problems, or our own thoughts, and external things, noise, light, sound, things like or, uh, environmental things like that. So if you think of the things that, that are internal to us, sleep disorders like sleep apnea, stopping mm -hmm. breathing in sleep, um, trouble sleeping from a variety of reasons to have insomnia where you know you're awake and not, not able to sleep can, can get in the way of sleep. So you kind of have to think about, did you sleep feel like you slept through the night, I went to bed at 10, I woke up at six, boy, I feel like I didn't sleep at all, even though I seem to have been in bed for eight hours and mm -hmm. slept. Maybe that's a poor quality sleep problem, or I was in bed, but I just couldn't sleep. That's an insomnia problem or a quantity of sleep problem. So kind of sorting out whether it's, it's the quality of sleep or how much sleep you got is the first place to start. Now, apnea is a term we've heard a lot, and that's the stopping of breathing many times during the night. Right. How do you know that that's happening to you? So sleep apnea, typically obstructive sleep apnea is the more common type, and it's obstruction or collapse of the airway. Uh, you might know you have it if, if you're just sleeping by yourself and nobody's listening to you or watching you sleep, you might know you have it because, like I said, you might be in bed and sleep and feel unrefreshed from mm -hmm. your sleep. Some people who have obstructive sleep apnea awaken themselves snoring or snorting or <laughs> kind of gasping. Mm -hmm. They might know it that way. Um, other people who have somebody to witness their sleep know that they snore, they're told they snore, or they might even be told they stop breathing. Which so is, is snoring a part of apnea in general? Yes, yeah, snoring is, is typically a part of apnea, but it doesn't have to be. Somebody can have bad obstructive sleep apnea and either not snore audibly or not know they snore. So we don't want to rely too much on the snoring history, but snoring is a big clue. If you do snore and your sleep isn't refreshing, then it's a strong clue that sleep apnea is likely. But it is possible for you to snore and still get a great night's sleep. Definitely. There are people who just have what we call primary snoring. It's just noisy <laughs> snoring. The airway doesn't stay stable, but it doesn't collapse enough to cause an arousal from sleep, either near closure or closure. And so you can snore. You can just be an annoying, be an annoying bed partner. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. So if one does have apnea and you, let's say you come to the sleep clinic and you get the, the test and, and what's involved in that? There's like some, I've seen the video where they kind of put patches on you and they let you sleep and monitor that. How does that work? Right. So coming in for a, a, an overnight sleep test involves a whole bunch of sensors on the body, on the head to measure whether you're sleeping or awake. It measures EEG or electroencephalograph brain waves to okay. see if, if the brain is awake or asleep. A couple next to the eyes to measure eye movements so we can see what stage of sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, can, mm -hmm. can have or has rapid eye movements, for example. Um, a couple of them under the chin for chin muscle tone, snoring sensors, um, EKG, um, heart rhythm, uh, on the on the chest, soft belts around the chest and abdomen, mm -hmm. and then movement sensors on the legs. So there are several little stickers, nothing painful, but all little pasted things all over the body that man that monitor sleep, and then um, little sensors in the nose and at the mouth to measure air movement. All of which sounds like you'd never sleep, <laughs> but people sleep just fine with it most of the time. And it's not like a completely normal night of sleep for a mm -hmm. lot of people at home. It's a good way to sample sleep. Most people sleep fine. Many people sleep a little less in the sleep lab than they would at home, but it's a plenty uh, good opportunity for us to record what happens when they do sleep to see if they have sleep 
sleep apnea. And so when someone does have apnea, and let's say they wake up 10 times a night, or is there a designation? If you wake up this many times, you need um, a CPAP machine. If you wake up this many times, maybe you need some ambient. Is yeah. there a so, so um, sleep apnea comes in different levels of severity. The, the sort of arbitrary numbers that we use are that each apnea or near, nearly stopping or stopping breathing event has to be at least 10 seconds long. That's how we count them, which came about because it encompasses a couple of breath cycles. Okay. So at least 10 seconds long, but then those have to occur at least five times an hour for us to be concerned about them. And so sleep apnea is defined as five or more times an hour. Five to 15 times an hour is mild, 15 to 30 or 40, depending on who you talk to, is moderate, and then over 30 or 40 is severe. But some people can have well over 100 episodes an hour stopping breathing. Wow. So several hundred episodes, and each time you stop breathing, it does several things to your body. It collapses your airway, you're breathing against closed airway, mm -hmm. which is very stressful to the brain and the body. And the brain tells your body, hey, wake up, open up the airway. And it's sort of an emergency. So that's why if you're watching someone who has this, they might <sighs> startle awake without even knowing they've done it. But then the fight or flight system kicks in. Mm -hmm. And remember, this can be hundreds of times a night. So it's super stressful on the body. Blood pressure goes up, the heart rate goes up, and all that sort of um, sympathetic nervous system or fight or flight system gets activated. And, then and none of go, that is restful. None of that is restful. <laughs> Just waking up from sleep it makes sleep less restful, plus all that that happens with the apnea that triggers mm -hmm. the fight or flight system. So if that happens several dozen or, or hundreds of times a night for some people, it's very disruptive to sleep. So that can cause sleepiness or fatigue the next day. You don't have to be falling asleep in your soup. You don't even have to be sleepy. You can just be fatigued okay. or not even that. Some people have all that sleep disruption and amazingly say, I feel pretty good, but they might not perform as well in their job without really knowing it. They might be less attentive, for example. We don't learn and remember as well. They might be irritable and might necessarily know it. <laughs> One um, of those where maybe you don't know how bad you feel until you feel good. Dad, we see that all the time, actually. <laughs> That's totally true. Somebody will come in and they'll say, I feel fine, but my wife says I snore and I stop breathing, so I'm here to make her happy. And then they come back after we diagnose and treat them and they say, I have no idea. I was so <laughs> tired. I feel so much better. So their normal becomes so tired that they don't really recognize how good normal is. And then the other things that can happen from obstructive sleep apnea are uh, higher blood pressure. Of course, when you stop breathing each time, the blood pressure goes up at the moment and then you fall back to sleep and it goes down. But do that enough times and it actually rises during the day. Oh. And so you can develop persistent high blood pressure or hypertension from sleep apnea. It raises blood glucose, blood sugar, mm -hmm and makes diabetes more likely, or if you have diabetes, it makes it harder to control. It also increases the risk of heart attack, stroke, funny heart rhythms that aren't healthy, like atrial fibrillation and mm -hmm. other ones. So it has a lot of medical consequences besides feeling tired. So if you suspect you have sleep apnea, there are lots of reasons to get it taken care of. So what treatment options are available? Treatment options include CPAP, which stands for Continuous Positive Airway Pressure, CPAP. That's a device that gives pressurized air through the nose or nose and mouth to keep the airway open. It's very effective and you wear a little mask over the nose or nose and mouth and it gives pressurized air just enough. Imagine that airway collapsing repeatedly during the night and having to wake up and open it up. I think of waking up as giving your airway a posture that mm -hmm. it doesn't have when you're sleeping. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> kind of like you lose your posture when you're, when you're uh, lying down. It opens up your airway with pressurized air just enough to give it a shape so that you can move air in and out. It's not extra oxygen for most people, it's just pressurized air and it works beautifully and it's it's measured to, to be set just at the right pressure that overcomes that airway collapse for that particular person. So CPAP is the standard treatment. Not everybody has to wear CPAP, but it's surprisingly comfortable and acceptable. A lot of people would look at it and say, you've got to be kidding me, I'm going to wear a mask. And I think of CPAP kind of like shoes. <laughs> I talk to my patients about this all the time. We didn't like shoes when our moms put them on us. We took them off, she'd put them on, we'd take them off. And then we kind of got used to the shoes and now we look for cute ones. Um, it's part of our wardrobe, just like clothing. CPAP for people who sleep with it becomes part of their wardrobe and it's very natural. So that's CPAP. It's the most effective thing. It treats almost everyone with obstructive sleep apnea if they wear it. Alternative treatments include 
an oral appliance, which can be manufactured to fit over the top and bottom teeth and adjustable so that the lower jaw is gently moved forward a little bit just while you're sleeping mm -hmm. um, to keep it in a forward position so it keeps the airway from c collapsing. Okay. So that's a nice alternative. Wait, and that that's not great for severe sleep apnea. It works for about two thirds, two out of three people with mild to moderate sleep okay. apnea. So it's a pretty good alternative for some people, but not everyone. And then the third alternative is weight loss, which works great, but for some people, mm -hmm. not everybody who has sleep apnea is overweight, by the way. Plenty of people have sleep apnea because of a jaw position or crowding in the soft okay. tissue in their throat. So um, if they have weight to lose and they have sleep apnea, weight loss can help it, but we never wait for it. You know this, <laughs> you're a personal trainer, we never wait for it, we don't rely on it, and we don't expect it, but if it happens in the long run and it gets rid of their sleep apnea, that's great, but we always treat them some other way first. And what about medications? Medications are not really effective for obstructive sleep apnea. Okay. Surgery on occasion is, only about a quarter of people who have throat surgery for sleep apnea get better on average, but if you pick just the right patient and they've got just the right reasons to have sleep apnea surgery can sometimes be helpful. So if someone is not sleeping well and there's not a biological reason for it, mm. but their mind is on overload, they've got a big project coming due at work, the kids aren't getting along, whatever the case may be, how do you overcome those obstacles so that someone sleeps well? Is that where the medications come in? Medications can be helpful, but I think of sleep, I think of insomnia, trouble sleeping, kind of like a symptom, sort of like pain is a symptom. Something is causing the pain, let's find out what that is and get rid of the thing that's causing the pain rather than giving medication Makes for the sense. pain, right? <laughs> so what we do is try to figure out what of the many reasons somebody might have that's causing insomnia, and very often it's more than one. This is why a sleep evaluation takes a good amount of time in our office. We spend a lot of time kind of walking down that road of what their experiences are. So you can generally find that they're external factors like stressors or noise or things that are hard to control, internal factors, worries and so things like that, um, or sleep habits. So the things that we do to ourselves that we're in control of, even some things that we think are helping our sleep, like sleeping in or lying awake in bed trying to sleep, some of those things we, we group into sleep hygiene. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of category two, the, the you know external factors and, and then behavioral things. And then the third category is something called conditioning. The fancy term is psychophysiological insomnia. Wow. Or <laughs> conditioned conditioning. insomnia or learned insomnia. That's a good term for it. So um, when, when we go to bed, we should feel sleepy. It should automatically feel like a comfortable place where we're ready to go to sleep. A lot of times we get into bed and if you've got that feeling where you're sleepy and falling asleep on the couch, maybe watching a little TV and you say, it must be my bedtime. Get up, get into your bed and all of a sudden you're wide awake. That happens to me sometimes. Okay, <laughs> right. And then you start processing. Uh -huh. That might be something called conditioned insomnia in which your brain has gotten into the habit of not being asleep in bed. So what I do is kind of sort through what of those things might be causing the insomnia. Everybody starts with a foundation of healthy sleep hygiene when they see me. So we, we go through good sleep habits and I can walk through some of those. Mm -hmm. And then, but if they have conditioned insomnia, then we do some specific things to address that. And if there are external factors, some of which we can't control, um, but we can try to maintain or improve some of the things that might be bothering them sort of from the outside room experiences and so on. So let's go through some of those. What's okay. good sleep hygiene? Mm, good sleep hygiene. <laughs> And we all have some opportunity for improvement in sleep hygiene, and so I talk to a lot of people and they say, I know you shouldn't read in bed. These aren't absolutes for everyone, but this is a foundation of, I think of it kind of like a recipe that is good behavior, especially for people who are having trouble sleeping. Mm -hmm. So if you're having trouble sleeping, the, the elements are go to bed about the same time each night, wake up about the same time each day. The wake up time is actually more important for setting your internal clock. So sleeping in on the weekends is not a good idea. It's not. It's a little bit like flying to California and then having to come back on Monday to Peoria. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it sort of gives you jet lag. If you sleep in a couple hours and shift your clock on weekends, if you're sleeping in and sleeping longer, it means you're probably not getting enough sleep on the weeknights. If you're staying up later and sleeping in later and getting about the same amount of sleep but just having a later time on the clock, mm -hmm. then you're kind of giving yourself jet lag. So keeping that wake up time relatively regular and giving yourself about an eight hour opportunity, seven to eight, depending on your needs. Less than that, even if you don't feel like it's causing the problem, less than seven usually isn't sufficient. 
all of us at less than six hours are impaired in our ability to perform as well as we should. So an opportunity of seven or eight hours of sleep about the same time each day or each night. And then and should you not read then? Right. So the other the next principle is really keep the bed for sleeping and intimacy. So I tell my patients, if you're not sleeping or getting lucky, get out of bed. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's really that the, the bed should be for for those two things and not doing other things, partly because we want to train the brain to be really ready to sleep and not have the habit of doing other things. So if really all you do is just those two things when you're in bed. When you go to bed, your brain is automatically going to have that, that nice reflex of thinking, oh, now I'm sleepy, this is what I do, without you having to think about it. So not lying awake, thinking, processing, surfing Facebook, watching television, reading, doing all those other things. Oh, I'm guilty. So <laughs> many of us like to do. <laughs> uh, and it's not that those are bad. If you read a little bit and you don't have any trouble sleeping, that's okay. Remember, if you're having trouble sleeping, these are the rules of the road. So, Got it. Um, so keep the bed just for sleeping and intimacy. And then the next best trick is not to look at the clock between bedtime and wake time, which means you set your alarm. Even if you don't have an urgency to get up the next day or an appointment or a job, still set your alarm so that you know what time you're supposed to get up and start your day, you also then know what time you're allowed to look at the clock. You know, I do that, and I don't know why I started doing that, but I realize that if I wake up in the middle of the night, I have this desire to look and see what time it is, so I see how much sleep time I still have left, but it makes me anxious. How often does that help you, right? It does not <laughs> it help doesn't you. Help at no all. good ever came of looking at the clock in the middle of the night. <laughs> None at all. If you, I tell my patients, if you have a sick child and you need to time a medication, or you get an urgent phone call, or you're a firefighter on call, and you need to take that call from home if you're a volunteer firefighter, look at the clock. Otherwise, settle down and don't look at the clock. And I tell my patients to turn it around or cover it up like a canary cage and cover <laughs> all the clocks in their house that they might encounter if they do get up at night. So no looking at the clock until the alarm. And then if you can't sleep, if it feels like you've been lying there for 15 or 20 minutes, don't look at the clock. But if you can't kind of settle down and, and fall asleep, then get up out of bed because lying in bed teaches your brain that there's something else to do there besides sleeping or intimacy. Mm -hmm. Get up out of bed, go to another room, read a book, do a puzzle like a Sudoku or crossword or word search or something quietly in another room. I like to have people sit up at a kitchen chair or a dining room mm. table so that they're not in their comfy chair about Got to fall it. asleep. <laughs> if they go to the <laughs> recliner where they fall asleep watching TV, that's not the place to go if they can't sleep at night. Sit up, read until you get drowsy again, or if you can't remember what you just read, then you're sleepy. Back, go to, back bed. to bed, exactly, and then keep the room cool and comfortable, um, quiet. Don't go to bed completely hungry. You can have a light snack. Limit fluids before bedtime so you don't have to get up to urinate. Well, um, we live in a very social community, and lots of fundraisers and dinners yes. and birthday parties and celebrations. And of course, the first thing that happens is someone puts a glass of wine in your hand, and before you know it, you've had two or three, and mm -hmm. now you go home and you either fall asleep and wake up, or you can't fall asleep at all. Right. So, so alcohol actually has a significant impact on sleep, and alcohol is fine for those of us who use it socially. But there are a few things that happen with alcohol. It disinhibits us, makes us feel happy. We like that. If you have enough of it, it makes you feel a little sleepy. So you might feel like, oh, I'm going to just go to sleep. And then halfway through the night, a funny thing happens with alcohol. It gets metabolized, so the body starts to, to get rid of it. But instead of getting back to your baseline, you go above your baseline for alertness a little bit, and mm. that fight or flight system kicks in a little bit. So you're a little more alert, your heart rate goes up, and you're, a little, you're having a little more trouble getting back to sleep. That is a little mini alcohol withdrawal in the middle of the night. Isn't that interesting? Oh, man. So having some cocktails in the evening might make you feel sleepy, but it disturbs the second half of the night. So if you're using alcohol to sleep or you're using it in a fairly generous amount on a regular basis, those are both unhealthy for sleep. Alcohol, socially, if you know you've had too much to drink, then you're just gonna have a bad night. Don't do it again, don't drive. But, <laughs> <All right. laughs> but alcohol affects sleep, particularly the second half of the night. It also makes sleep apnea worse because it, it relaxes the airway and, mm -hmm. and reduces the airway stability. It also reduces our ability to awaken from the stimulus of a collapsed airway. So it can, can and it reduces the, the natural reflex of the tongue stabilizing when we breathe in. So there are three or four reasons that alcohol makes sleep apnea worse. So if you have sleep apnea, be very careful with alcohol until you get it treated. Very good point. So we've been talking a lot about adult sleep disorders. What about children? How much sleep 
does the average child need per night and what are the age delineations there? My favorite age delineation, my favorite way to remember amount of sleep by age is 10 by 10. 10 year olds need about 10 hours of sleep. Littler kids need more. Little babies sleep like house cats, like 16, 18 hours a day. And then toddlers, 14 to, to 12 hours a night um, with a nap in there included. And then by the time they're in early grade school, by kindergarten or first grade, after age five, no nap should be necessary. If you've got a child who's sleeping in the daytime at age six or older, that's excessively sleepy. And so you know, need to figure out why that is. And, and unfortunate, then, I always miss nap times. So <laughs> <laughs> that's Darn. quality, house cleaning time or <laughs> yes. mommy time. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so no sleeping while the baby sleeps. Um, and then teenagers need a surprisingly greater amount. Teenagers are built like us, they look like adults, and we think, well, they probably need about eight hours of sleep, but actually they often need nine or ten. Mm. So in that developmental age before they're out of their teens, they still are going to need more sleep than adults, often nine or ten hours. Teenagers are very commonly sleep deprived. So getting enough sleep is is the first start. And then getting regular sleep for, for kids is a, is a key. And then caffeine in, in kids, we didn't talk about caffeine for mm. adults yet, but caffeine for kids probably doesn't have much of a role. It's, it gets metabolized by the body more slowly by younger children and it's a it's a very common reason for kids to have some trouble sleeping and adults okay. even a little coffee early in the day can affect sleep at night so if somebody's having trouble sleeping we say taper completely off of caffeine while we're resetting that's part of healthy sleep hygiene and what about other sleep hygiene habits for kids I've got two kids at home who love their screens oh yeah and they're <laughs> always on something a phone an iPad a video game something and I'm always encouraging them to stop that about half an hour before they go to bed is that sage advice or no? That's sage advice actually. There's good, there's good reason for that for, for a few reasons. First of all, let's back up from there. In bed, we've already talked about only sleep and for adults intimacy for kids really sleep only in bed. All the electronics and everything should happen elsewhere and even if they're relaxing and so on, all that stuff should happen outside of the bed or bedroom. Before bedtime, if you give your kids about a half an hour or maybe even longer without a screen, it kind of lets them settle down, it lets them disconnect from whatever they were doing because it's very engaging. And how fun is it? We've got all this great electronica to <laughs> yeah. use. And parents can you know, frequently say, oh, too many screens, too much electronica. Think of how great this is for kids to enjoy, for all of us to enjoy mm -hmm. the technology we have, but there's a place for it. So disengaging from that a little bit, sort of from the activity of it, but also there, there's something that's um, in, in the screens, there's evidence that, that the blue light waves that are emitted from the screen mm -hmm can suppress melatonin, and melatonin is part of our sleep chemistry. Okay. So it may help biologically delay sleep if we've got too much screen time too close to bedtime. So you're exactly right, letting them yes. kind of wrap up those. And what I suggest <laughs> is a parking lot, and I can't say that we're super strict about this at our house either. I'm a parent, I'm a human being, and there's a lot of flexibility in life. Yes. But um, but the, the, the best theory is a, a parking lot, maybe the best method is a parking lot for the devices in the kitchen or someplace away from the bedrooms where it's not tempting to. Check all those things. I feel like I could talk to you about sleep all day long, and unfortunately, we've just got a few minutes left, but I wanted to find out how you got involved in sleep. Why did it become so fascinating for you? I'm a neurologist, and I, I became a neurologist after I was, I was on a, a path, surprising myself, on a path in medical school to become a pathologist, which I loved, which wouldn't have been seeing patients, would have been doing surgical cases and autopsies, and mm -hmm. I, I ended up finding in my clinical rotations that I loved neurology. I loved the... In pathology, I loved the answering the questions that other people didn't get a chance to answer because they didn't get to see it in front of their eyes. Neurology was a little bit of that unfolding the, the box or opening up the box that other people didn't necessarily get to look into mm. either. So it was the slew thing, the answering the questions. I thought the neurological diseases were very interesting. But then as I went through neurology, sleep became the most interesting because there was that. And it's not the most complicated in neurology. There's some really interesting complex neurology that happens. Sleep isn't the most complex neurology, but it's globally very interesting because it includes a lot of patient experience, a lot of behavior. Uh, it's very, um, the, the emphasis on the patient's story and how they got to their sleeping situation is very valuable. And so putting that all together, sort of decoding the puzzle for the patient is very satisfying for me. It happens that it's also a whole wealth of treatable disorders. So it's a very satisfying um, way to practice medicine. It's, it's interesting. We get to see the whole breadth, um, the spectrum of ages, newborns to the very elderly. Mm -hmm. 
there's a lot of stuff to be done in sleep research, so it kept a lot of doors open. I do some clinical research, and it's it's a ton of fun to practice, and I can't imagine a better fit for me. So there will always be work for you. There will be always <laughs> will be work for me. There seems not to be a shortage of sleep disorders. So, <laughs> Dr. Zalek, thank you very much for your time and for your information. You are a wealth of knowledge. I appreciate having you here on Consider This, and we wish you continued success in your medical practice. Thank you so much, Yvonne. It's been a pleasure to be here. Well, I hope that helped all of you at home who are trying to catch those Z's. Remember your good sleep hygiene habits and make sure that the bed is just for getting lucky and going to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you next time on Consider This. I'm Yvonne Greer. Thank you for watching.